Today's episode is brought to you by Freedom Project Academy. Looking for a K-12 classical online school built on Judeo-Christian values? FPA is enrolling now for the fall. Request your free information packet at freedomforschool.com. That's freedom, F-O-R, school.com. It's time to get educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. This is the Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Duke, sitting again besides the great Katie Petrick. Before we get started, please hit that share button so we can get oodles and oodles more patriots involved in what we up to. Okay, today's start in Massachusetts, Worcester, Mass, to be per precise, where an area bishop is actually taking a stand for Catholic church values when it comes to Catholic schools. What an odd concept. Catholic schools proudly displaying pride flags and Black Lives Matter, just a little too much to the, for the good bish bishop. This takes place again in Worcester, Mass. This is Bishop Robert J. McManus. Uh, this is a Catholic school that is uh, a Jesuit school. That may actually help explain this if you consider that our current Pope, uh, Bergoglio, is actually a Jesuit. The Jesuits are the radical left of the Catholic Church, the Marxist, if you will, of the Catholic Church. We're not surprised that a Jesuit Catholic school is off the rails, but this bishop did, bishop did the right thing. He issued a decree saying that a school, this particular school, can no longer bear the name Catholic because of its refusal to take down Black Lives Matter flags and LGBTQ pride flags. This is Nativity School of Worcester and has been flying these flags for at least a year. And take a look at this video. It will explain the situation to you. Beneath the American flag, a pride flag and a Black Lives Matter flag have been flying outside the Nativity School of Worcester for more than a year. The school teaches about 60 boys in grades five through eight from both Catholic and non-Catholic families. The school says the flags are, quote, to remind our young men, their families, and Nativity Worcester staff that all are welcome here and that they are valued and safe in this place. However, Bishop Robert McManus, seen here in file video, says the BLM flag has, quote, been co-opted by some factions which instill broad brush distrust of police. And the LGBTQ pride flag, he says, runs counter to church teaching that sacramental marriage is between a man and a woman. In a statement, Bishop McManus questioned if the school should still be called Catholic and some parishioners leaving midday mass at the cathedral agree. Yeah, I agree with Bishop McManus and what he's doing, and I think uh, all bishops across the country should be making statements for all Catholic schools who are doing the same thing. If they want to continue to call themselves a Catholic school, then they should follow his guidelines. But the school points out it does not answer to the local bishop, but rather to the Jesuits, an independent order of the Catholic Church headquartered in Rome. The school says it provides tuition-free education, mostly to students of color with funding from private donations. This mother, who says her son is applying to be a student here, thinks the school should stand its ground. And we're in 2022. It's like we all come from different backgrounds. We have different beliefs. Let's just be kind to one another and let, let people be. Well, that's fine and dandy, but those beliefs, when you're talking about a Catholic school, need to uphold Catholic value and beliefs. Am I missing something? Well, am I? Am I? Uh, let be. Who's letting that? Th these kids get to go to school regardless. You're advertising for the LGBTQ and Black Lives Matter. You're not advertising for Jewish kids or secular kids to come. You're not ad asking twins to join us or Protestants. Why highlight those? That's it, Miss. It's not about the the who can and can't come. It's who's being prefer given preferential treatment. Well. Let's take a look at the statement, the actual decree, if you will, uh, that was published, and it says the Nativity School of uh, Worcester is prohibited from this time forward from identifying itself as a Catholic school and may no longer use the title Catholic to describe itself. Mass, sacraments, and sacramentals are no longer permitted to be celebrated on Nativity School premises or be sponsored by Nativity School in any church building or chapel within the Diocese of Worcester. The Nativity School is not allowed to undertake any fundraising involving diocesan institutions in the Diocese of Worcester and is not permitted to be listed or advertised in the directory. The name of Bishop Emeritus Daniel P. Riley must be removed from the list of the Board of Trustees of Nativity School. And the best part of this entire decree is that this decree is effective immediately. I order that this decree be published. Dun, dun, dun. And I guess I just want this bishop to be 
put next to another bishop who actually stood his ground for being a good Catholic there, Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion, who you may remember said, hey, Nancy Pelosi, you support abortion the way you do? It wasn't no soup for you, but it was no communion for you. So we do have a few bishops across the nation who are trying to do some sort of good and follow, you know, Catholic doctrine. Well, this may be a Jesuit funded or sponsored school, but it is in the diocese of the good Robert J. McManus, which means he has a say and really a leading say of what goes on in Catholic matters inside of his diocese. So that needs to be uh, remembered. And let's be very clear, McManus is not an ideologue. Here's a direct quote. Uh, McManus said that the church supports the phrase, quote, Black Lives Matter, unquote, but went on to assert that the BLM organization had, quote, co-opted the phrase and promotes a platform that directly contradicts Catholic, Catholic social teaching on the importance and role of the nuclear family and seeks to disrupt the family structure in clear opposition to the teachings of the church, unquote. He is exactly right. They've taken it down from their, ma their, their master page, but one of the major points that Black Lives, Ladder has been, let Black Lives Matter have been pushing over and above racial issues is the idea that the nuclear family must go. Open borders is what they're calling for, an end of private property. All of these things are not aligned with Catholic philosophy or certainly Catholic dogma. So the, in every way here, Bishop McManus is doing exactly what he ought to be doing. With all the censorship taking place on social media platforms, we've made it easy to keep up with your favorite content. Simply download the Freedom Project Media app in your app store. Get access to 18 new videos a week, plus thousands of archived shows, lecture series, and educational animations. Download the Freedom Project Media app on your Apple TV, Roku, tablet, or phone, and make sure you allow for notifications to keep you informed. On the West Coast, the University of California system is continuing to be amazing, amazingly bad at what they're doing for education, but amazing nonetheless. They're now going to introduce a climate justice course in the 10 campus system to address, obviously, the social, racial, and environmental injustices of climate change. <sighs> you got to remember. If you haven't been paying attention to us, if you've watched us, uh, the UC system is the same same system that decided that you don't need to take an SAT or an ACT to come here. Just <laughs> open the doors, everyone, come on in. Uh, now they say, "Hey, let's be justice for the climate," because we haven't been so far. They announced that a fall 2022 pilot class is slated to be focused at UC Merced ahead of a planned expansion to all 10 of the campuses by spring of this next year. So they'll pilot it in the fall and clearly they know it's going to be so amazingly successful that they're going to put it out to all 10 campuses. And as their announcement of it begins, undergraduates will have a new one of a kind class they can sign up for this fall. Climate justice a hybrid course that features lectures by faculty from all 10 UC campuses. According to the UC Center for Climate Justice's website, climate justice recognizes the disproportionate impacts of climate change on low-income communities and communities of color around the world, the people and places least responsible for the program, or problem. Yeah, are they? Uh, are they though? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dr. Duke, I think you have some feelings yeah, about that. Uh, first thought is, notice that they, this is very telling, they call it climate, not environment. That's a dead tip off, right? If you're really concerned about what's going on, call it environmental. Make it a course about environmentalism, but you're making it a course on climate. Climate is not what's happening here. This is not about climate. And it gets even really creepier when you look at some of the people who are behind this. Take, for instance, uh, teaching associate professor and UC presidential chair, Tracy Osborne, whose research includes climate justice, climate finance, finance, climate change mitigation in tropical forests and climate communication, outreach and engagement among others. Uh, over and over again, Osborne has founded the UC Center for Climate Justice more than a year ago. The center led by Osborne includes six pillars of climate justice. And do you get the point here again? Uh, 
we stopped using the word global warming because, you know, they couldn't keep documented, documenting warning, warming. Now we're even moving away from the environmental aspect of this and everything is about climate. So Osborne, who's teaching this course, uh, you got to remember that that climate justice that she founded about a year ago um, has this six pillars of climate justice. Um, and these pillars, you really need to understand, especially that sixth one. Were pillars made with concrete? Hopefully not, because that's... Ooh, on climate. Ooh, like. It's not good for the, the, the climate or the justice. So we have the social, racial, and environmental justice. We have the indigenous climate action. We have community resilience and adaptation. We have natural climate solutions, climate education and engagement. And we have just transition, like just not oh it's just trans it's just transition and as she explained you know it's the green new deal that's just transition uh as the center states the green new deal for example is an innovative proposal that tackles both climate change and inequality and is therefore very much aligned with climate justice as osborne has said i think what we're doing now is unique and it's something needed now more than ever which is to focus on various dimensions of climate justice how many times can she say climate and justice to make you think that she's saying something important? And as, as if the Green New Deal hasn't been completely mocked by everybody who understands economics, scientists, uh, uh, people who understand public welfare. I mean, outside of the realm of AOC, nobody takes this seriously. Right. So the fact, that they're, the fact that we're coming back around to this is a big deal. Are you saying that the Green New Deal falls flatulence? Uh, I see what you did there. All right, so let's just take a look at the actual curriculum itself because that's what we're here to learn about, the climate justice curriculum. And as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, uh, the arc of moral universe is long, but it bends toward oh, justice. They just had to find a justice quote, and that's what they found, so they, they threw it up there. Uh, the course itself, it's going to be based on those lectures from, as we said, the professors across the whole UC system, and they're designed to mobilize students toward climate action and cultivate prolonged climate engagement. The lectures given in the curriculum will center around the impacts of climate change on communities of color and low-income communities, and uh, there is going to be a lecture that is actually titled Feeling Climate, colon, an emotional toolkit for an uncertain future. So kids... You see system. I mean, if you really want to enjoy yourself, take anything but this course. Take one last quick look at that creed. Notice how it's climate justice again. Notice how the quote from Martin Luther King is about race, not about the environment, which means it, the critical race theory they're teaching that forces you to see color is exactly what Luther King fought against. And finally, look at that screed. Not a single mention of the word environment. The environment, environment no, longer has matters, no longer matters to these people. This is about climate, which is a much, much different thing. Don't ever forget that. Today's show is sponsored by our friends at MyPillow. Save up to 66% on all items at MyPillow.com when you use the code Dr. Duke. That's D-R-D-U-K-E. Support this show by supporting a great American company. We have some more non-science coming your way because we now have a half million dollars, 500,000, in taxpayer money being uh, absolutely positively necessary to study the unbearable whiteness that is happening in physics. It's funded through a $495,000, $847 National Science Foundation grant. So researchers Amy Robertson and W. Tali Hairston from the Seattle Public University can uh, aim to develop a knowledge base that could lead to awareness of how power relations may be embedded in the way physics is taught and learned. So let me get this straight here, if I'm allowed to get things straight anymore. We're giving about 500 k so these two people can take a look at physics classrooms at the university level and see how it's like white supremacy happening? Is that, is that where you're gathering from what this, I'm Dr. Duke? What I'm seeing is that it, the reason we have to investigate physics because the, the titans of, tis, of physics going all the way back to Isaac Newton are all white. 
Hot. And you don't like it. I get you don't like it. But just because Newton was white doesn't change the truth of what he said. Just because modern physics, oh, you know, it must be this, Katie. It must be this. When you get, glance up into the sky at night and when you see space filmed, mm -hmm. it's always black. Mm. And there's very little white. Mm. And if space is predominantly black, shouldn't physics teachers and students be mostly black? I mean, you're studying blackness, right? You know what? Whiteness just, is attacking the blackness of space. And I just found another issue. What, what songs do you sing about that darkness? You don't. You sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Uh, they always, all about the white. All the little white. You're exactly right. They, they really highlight those asteroids with their tails. And so what they should have done is spent money to develop these songs that are for the dark universe. But so far, at least, they've been spending their money on the other things. One of the studies that they did uh, was actually Robertson and a colleague from uh, Seattle who examined the demographic characteristics of students in an introductory physics class at six universities to see which groups were over or underrepresented. Ooh, I don't know how that costs any money to look at, but whatever. 500K to, do, to count. That's part to of it. To literally to count. That's part of it. That's part of it. Another one of the stories that this 495K actually funded was Hairston and two of his colleagues recording nearly two weeks of footage from an introductory physics class at three universities, and then they analyzed a single seemingly uneventful event um, in which a group of students completed a hands-on in-class assignment dealing with mass and acceleration. Wow. But that's not even the best. The most notable study of the Robertson and Hairston uh, NSF-funded collaboration is observing whiteness in introductory physics a case study, because we have to have that colon in there. Colon, a case study. It was recently published in the prominent physics education journal, Physical Review Physics Education Research. And for this study, the two researchers, they viewed and they analyzed. Oh, I mean, this one, this one cost a lot of money and a lot of time of six and a half minutes. They observed six and a half minutes of footage from one introductory physics course and then they decided, okay, we're going to interview the kids involved, the key, key players involved in this six-and-a-half-minute clip. Now, according to Robertson and Harrison's description of those six-and-a-half minutes, a biracial but culturally white female physics professor hmm, gave an assignment to a group of students comprised of a male student of Middle Eastern descent, a few female or a female Hispanic student, and a white female student. Okay, so we got three students. Uh, the assignment was to draw an energy interaction diagram on a whiteboard within a limited amount of time. And during this limited amount of time, all six and a half minutes of it, the male student of Middle Eastern descent referred to by the pseudonym Drake. I highly doubt his name was anything near Drake. He took charge. He proceeded to work on the assignment while the other two female students referred uh, as by pseudonyms of Paris and Gale, they attempted to make sense of some of the relevant instructions and concepts, making some contributions of their own along the way. Oh my gosh, this, I, I am so intrigued. I mean, are you not, you wanna hear the rest of it, I understand, I can tell, I can see, I mean, look at that, you, you just can't wait for me to finish the story. Now, nothing seemingly out of the ordinary had happened, except something did happen, even though nothing did happen. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Nothing racial or disrespectful, but as the researchers observed, an interaction in which Drake and the representation he is constructing are centered, and Gale and Paris's sense-making and contributions are marginalized. Mm. This social organization is co-constructed and co-maintained by at least five mechanisms of control. The energy interaction diagram, representation, physics values, the use of whiteboards, gendered social norms, and the structure of schooling. Look, let, let, me, let me hack this down to size. There's not a single white man participating. You got a culturally, uh, a, a biracial teacher who identifies as white. What does that mean? Oh, you got, they're uh, you got, just yeah, spinning. You, you got a Middle Eastern dude and you got three women. Expli play, explain to him, two women, explain to me how any of that can be blamed on the white maleocracy here. It can't be, it can't be. You got what you want, more women than men. You got what you want, no white men, and you're still gavetching. <laughs> gavetching, that's a nice one. Now, according to the college fix story that this was 
printed in. In the pluriverse, I like that, in the pluriverse that Robertson and Hairston imagined, things would be different. Instead of having a predefined task handed to them by their professor with the expectation that they do it correctly, Drake, Paris, and Gale would collaboratively establish a shared purpose with many solutions and approaches. Now, Drake's attempt to solve the problem would be valued equally with Paris and Gale's sense making. A critical discussion of how systems of power uphold mainstream academic knowledge would ensue. That's what it is. We need, if, if everyone can't be exactly the same, then everyone is wrong so biracial teachers and non-western and not male students are the ones who are controlling physics and turning it into an evil thing then shouldn't we start limiting biracial women and middle eastern men from participating it's what you're doing to white guys right you know here at the dr duke show we're all about education content it's always the primary focus, but sometimes we just need something else. So before we go, let's leave you with some other stories that's worthy of maybe 17 comments. And we're going to start in Seattle as a CEO of the mammoth coffee shop Starbucks says he will do anything, anything to get the people back to work. Speaking at an event for the New York Times, Howard Schultz says, I have been unsuccessful despite everything I've tried to do to get our people back to work. I've pleaded with them. I said I'll get m on my knees. I'll do push-ups. Joe Biden style. Whatever you want, come back. Schultz says while he understands flexible working environments are the wave of the future, it's hard to understand how people can be as efficient and develop the next big idea through collaboration if employees are not ever around each other. While he has not mandated employees return to the office, he envisions a middle ground where people are there a few days a week. Clearly, they need some caffeine. Now, staying on the West Coast, the San Francisco Unified School District says it will no longer use the word chief in job titles over cultural concerns for a Native American connection. A spokeswoman says, while there are many opinions on the matter, our leadership team agreed that, given that Native American members of our community have expressed concerns over the use of the title, we are no longer going to use it. Despite the fact that the district employs 10,000 people, only 13 had the title of chief. They now have all been changed to division head. Duke, have at it. Well, first of all, Howard Schultz, the fact that you are too little of a leader to actually mandate attendance for your employees means you get exactly what you, you deserve. You own it, you, all the, all the push-ups in the world aren't gonna make you m less of a panty waste, number one. And number two, I would love to see the in Native Americans who actually complained about the use of the word chief. I bet they don't exist, period. Why are you, San Francisco, erasing chiefs? Shouldn't only Native Americans be able to do that? Shouldn't a, a Native American have decided and spoke that you as a white person have the right to nullify the word chief? It seems like you're going after Native American language pretty hard. We go from one gross city to one that could potentially be falling into the same category as residents in North Carolina are being offered big mucho buckaroos to live with cockroaches. The Pest Informer, a Raleigh-based company, is offering homeowners $2,000 to allow 100 American cockroaches into their home for a pest control treatment study. The company says the new tenants would be placed into their homes for 30 days, at which time a new technique will be used to hopefully eradicate the roaches and gauge how effective the treatment is. American cockroaches are the largest of the house-infesting roach species in the U.S., growing as big as three inches long or about basically your thumb uh they also have wings and can fly mm -hmm. so far the company has received more than 2200 applicants duke i hear you got a new house all i'd have to say is you'd have to pay me a lot more than two thousand dollars to live with 100 progressive educrats that's all i gotta say all right that's gonna wrap it up this time for this segment we'll see you next time all right, that does it for us again on this show. For all of us at Freedom Project, stay educated, my friends.